Good day, grade 11s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. Uh, sorry for the slight delay. I had a problem with my laptop. Um, anyway, quantitative aspects of chemical change. What we're going to do is we're going to do a couple more questions on quantitative aspects of chemical change. And then we're going to start electro electrostatics. Yay! So um, let's get going. The reason I am doing this quantitative um, aspects of chemical change or stoichiometry so much is because if you have a look at the prelim papers for this year um, from all across the country so you will notice that they've actually been quite sneaky and they've snuck stoichiometry and quantitative aspects of chemical change into a lot of the different sections so before where it used to be considered only a grade 11 topic even though effectively is grade 12 as well um, they never really used to ask it that much they used to maybe sneak it into acids and bases now it was in acids and bases it was in chemical equilibria it was in basically spotted around the whole paper so they're definitely increasing the weighting of this in the um, the weighting of this in the in the final exams for matric, so that is why I am going on and on about this. Right, so it says consider the following compound: magnesium sulfate dot seven H two O. So what does this dot mean? This means that this bit here is called water of crystallization. Crystallization water of crystallization okay and this water of crystallization um is basically going to be saying that for every one magnesium sulfate there are seven waters now please understand that in maths i know the dot means times but in this case it doesn't what it means is that you've got one magnesium sulfate plus seven water molecules attached to it. That's what it really means, okay? Now, they've asked us to determine the percentage of sulfur present in the compound. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the molar mass of the whole thing, and we're going to look at the molar mass of sulfur, and then all that we are going to do is we are going to um, work it out. We're going to work out what the um, percentage is of the sulfur out of the whole thing. So for this, you need to get out your periodic tables. Um, I keep stressing with you guys that you need to have your periodic tables with you at all times, data sheets and periodic tables with you at all times. I'm not going to put up a periodic table and flip between the pages. You guys need to have your periodic tables with you when you're studying chemistry and you need your data sheets at all times anyway. They're part of the tools together with your pens and your pencils and your calculators, etc. Okay, so right, let's have a look at this. We've got magnesium. So the molar mass of magnesium. So let's look at the molar mass of MgSO4.7H2O. So that is going to be the molar mass of magnesium, if you look at your periodic table, is 24. Plus sulfur is 32. Plus you've got four oxygen, so it's four times 16 plus seven times the water. And the water is made up of two hydrogens plus one oxygen of 16. Okay, so therefore, if we get out our calculators, which we can do, let's get it out. And we're going to add this up on our calculator. Okay, so it is 24 plus 32, wait, plus 32 plus bracket 4 times 16 bracket plus bracket and it's 7 times and do you agree that 2 plus 16 is 18 so that's 18 close bracket equals so that comes to a total of 246 so that's 246 grams per mole so the molar mass the formula mass of this whole thing is 246 now they want to know what the percentage of sulfur is present in this compound so the percentage of sulfur is going to be the molar mass of sulfur which is 32 divided by 246 times by 100 over 1 obviously to get the percent 
So let's work out what that is. So it's going to be 32 divided by 246 equals, and then we multiply it by 100, equals, and then we press the SD button, and it gives us 13.008. Remember, we always round off in science to two decimal places, so we look at that 8, it's going to push that up to 1, so that becomes 13,01. Percent. So the percentage composition of sulfur present is 13,01%. Now it says calculate the mass of water in 5 grams of the salt. Okay. So this is interesting because what we have here is the molar mass. This is the molar mass of the whole salt. Okay. Now, they only want the mass of the water in five grams. So what we need to do is work out the number of moles, okay? Why? Because we know that for every mole, for every mole of the salt, for every mole of the salt, we've got seven moles of water attached to it, okay? There's a one to seven ratio here. So if we work out the number of moles of the salt, we can work out the number of moles of water we have, and then we can find out the mass, okay? Do you understand? So let's just change color so you can see where the working is. So first of all, number of moles is mass over the molar mass or formula mass. So we want to calculate the mass of water in five grams, so it's mass is five, over 246, that's going to give us the number of moles of this compound we have. So let's do that. So we've got 5, 5, divided by 2, 46, equals SD button, 0.02 moles. So we've got 0.02 moles of this compound. But for every, like I said, for every mole, we've got seven moles. So we're going to multiply this by seven to get the number of moles of H2O that we actually have, okay? So let's work that out. So we're going to take that and we're going to times it by seven. And that's going to give us 0.14 moles, 0.14 moles. Now, if we want to find the mass, what do we do? We go number of moles is mass over molar mass. Therefore, number of moles times by the molar mass is equal to the mass. So in this case, it's going to be 0.14 multiplied by 18. How am I getting 18? Well, 2 plus 16 is 18. It's two hydrogens and one oxygen. So if I work out what that at is, M is going to be what? Um, it's going to be 18, no, let's clear that, 18 multiplied by 0 0.14 equals 2.52. So that's 2,52 grams. So 2.52 grams of your 5 gram salt is water. Okay, not too bad here. Now it says, new question, erase, blink. Calculate the mass of sulfuric acid present in 200 cubic centimeters of a 0.25 mole per decimeter cube solution of sulfuric acid. Sure. Okay, so first of all, we know concentration is number of moles over volume. Okay, so it says they want the mass. We also know the number of moles is mass over the molar mass. So you can do it in one calculation. I'm very happy for you to do it in one calculation. But I think let's just do it in two separate bits so it's easier for us to understand. So the concentration, do you see the concentration they've given us? It's 0.25. The concentration is 0.25 moles per decimeter cubed. So the volume that they're using is decimeter cubed, right? What do we have? We've got centimeters cubed. So we have to convert our volume to decimeters cubed. And the way we do that is dividing by a thousand. So we're going to go 200 divided by a thousand, which is 0, 0,2 decimeters cubed. Okay. So now we can use this formula. We can go N 
equals, oh, sorry, we can go in equals CV, which is 0, 0,25 multiplied by 0, 0,2. Okay, so what does that give us? Let's go to use our calculator. So that is 0, 0.25 multiplied by 0, 0.2 equals 0,05. So the number of moles is 0,05 moles. Okay, but they didn't ask for moles. They asked for mass. They asked for mass. So therefore, we can say, well, in that case, we can use this formula. Number of moles is molar mass of a molar mass. The molar mass of sulfuric acid is going to be is going to be equal to sulf hydrogen is one so it's two times one plus sulfur which is 32 plus four times oxygen which is 16 so that becomes two plus 32 uh, which is 64 okay so that becomes why am i even doing this okay never mind so it becomes eight and three and two is nine. So it's 98 grams per mole. So now we can find out the mass because the mass equals number of moles times the molar mass or formula mass, which is gonna be 0, 0,05 multiplied by 98. Okay, so let's go look at that. So it's 0, 0.05 multiplied by 98 equals press the SD button 4,9. So that's 4,9 grams. 4,9 grams. There you go. Not too bad. Hey, let's do another example. Okay, defining the term molar mass is um, in your information sheets, in your exam guidelines. And again, it's theory, but remember that you can't just say it's a mass of one mole. You act, although it is the mass of one mole, what you're looking at is the fact that it's the um, mass of one mole, where one mole is the equivalent of one of the number of particles that there are in one twelfth of carbon twelve. Okay, so be careful of that. Okay, right. Then it says, calculate the number of moles of water in a hundred grams of water. Okay, so number of moles is mass over molar mass, right? The water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, as you know, it's H2O. So it's two times one plus 16, which is 18 grams per mole. And then they want the number of moles. So therefore the number of moles is 100 divided by 18. And now we just need our calculator. So it's 100 divided by 18, which equals 5.56, 5,56 moles. Okay, there we go. Now we get to a decent question. It says methyl benzoate is a compound used in the process of perfumes. It is that found that a 5,325 gram sample of methyl benzoate contains 3,758 grams of carbon, 0, 0,316 grams of hydrogen, and 1,251 grams of oxygen. It says define the term empirical formula. Well, obviously empirical formula is just your basic ratio of the element mints that are found in this substance, okay? Now they said determine the empirical formula of methyl benzoate. So let's think about this. What do they normally do? They normally give you percentages, right? They'll normally say like, oh, 15% is made up of carbon and 2% is made up of hydrogen and whatever, okay? But now instead they've given you the total sample mass and they've given the individual masses of these Element. So do you agree that you can actually get the percentages yourself? Okay, we've got, what have we got? We've got carbon, we've got hydrogen, and we've got oxygen. So the percentage would just be the mass over the total mass. So the carbon 
is going to be 3 comma 7 5 8 over 5 comma 3 2 5 times by 100 over 1 hydrogen okay let's just move this over a little bit so that there's more space to write hydrogen is going to be 0, 0,316 over 5, 325 times by 100 over 1. Oxygen is going to be 1, 251 over 5, 325 times by 100 over 1. So what am I doing? I'm working out the percentages. I'm working out the percentage composition as of, at the moment, okay? So let's do that on our calculator. Okay, so let's start with this. We've got 3.758 divided by 5.3 two five equals times by a hundred to convert it to percentage equals and then we press the SD button and we get seventy point five seven. So seventy comma five seven percent of this molecule is made up of carbon. Now let's look at the hydrogen. Hydrogen is going to be naught comma 316 divided by 5.325 equals, and then we times it by 100 to get to our percentage, equals, and then it's 5,93. So that's 5,93%. Then let's look at this one. We've got 1, 251 divided by 5, 325 equals times by 100 equals SD button 23.49. So that's 23,49%. And at this point now, we are at the point where we usually have to work out our empirical formula. Because what are we going to do? We're now going to work out the mole ratio. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide by our molar mass, molar mass to get the mole ratio. So we're going to divide this by 12. We're going to divide this by 1. And we're going to divide this by 16. So this is obviously 5,93. That was really easy. Let's take this 23.49. Um, 23.49 and divide it by 16. Nope. Nope. 16. And uh, that is going to give us 1.47. That's 1, 47. And let's do the carbon. 70, 57 divided by 12 equals 5,88. 5,88. Okay. So do you agree we now have a mole ratio of 1,47, 5.93 and 5.88, which is useless. So what, because we always want a ratio of 1 to something to something. So what we're going to do is divide by the smallest number, right? So we're going to divide this by 1,47, we're going to divide this by 1,47 and we're going to divide this by 1,47. Okay, so let's do that. So that's obviously one. So I'm going to go 5.88 divided by 1, 47. And that's going to give me 4. So that's effectively 4, right? That's obviously a 1. 5.93, let's just do it. 5.93. Three divided by one point four seven equals.
and that's as close as one is four as well. So therefore we've got C4, H4, O. Okay, so that is my empirical formula of my methyl benzoate. Okay, that is my empirical formula. Now they say if the molar mass of methyl benzoate is 136 grams per mole, what is the molecular formula? Okay, so let's work out what this empirical formula mass comes to, shall we? It's 4, let's try again, 4 times 12 plus 4 plus 16. So that's 48 plus 20, which comes to 68. So do you agree that if I multiply that by 2, I get 136. 68 times 2 is 136. Therefore, my molecular formula has to be double this. It has to be double as big. So my molecular formula is going to be C8 H8O2. There we go. All right, not too bad here. You just have to take things in baby steps. This year was the only tricky part. Actually, no, that was the easy part. That was the tricky part, was knowing that you needed to change it into percentages and then you could work like usual. Okay. Right, oops, wrong way. Okay, next. Define the term limiting reactant. Well, obviously the limiting reactant is the one that limits the reaction, but the reason it limits the reaction is because it is the reactant that's going to be used up first. It is going to be used up first and therefore it limits how much product is being produced. Right, now it says, Iron, which is Fe, in case you didn't know, reacts with sulfur, S, to form iron sulfide, according to the following balanced equation. It says, calculate which of these two substances will be used up completely if you've got 20 grams of Fe and 10 grams of S are mixed and heated. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is work out the number of moles that each of this gives us, okay? So let's do that. The number of moles of Fe is going to be the mass of Fe, which is 20, divided by the molar mass of Fe, which is 56. Okay, 56. So if we work that out on our calculators, we go 20 divided by 56. That is going to give me 0.36. 0.36, okay? The number of moles of sulfur is going to be 10 divided by 32. So it's 10 divided by 32, which is going to be 0.31. So do you agree that the limiting reagent is the sulfur? because we've got 0.31 moles of sulfur and 0.36 moles of iron. So it's obvious therefore that we're gonna use up the sulfur before the iron, and therefore this year, this 0.31 is my limiting reagent, which is the sulfur. Then it says how many grams of the other substance are in excess? Okay, well, do you agree that if we look at this, it's a ratio of one to one, right? Which I was using at the time. That means that if we use up all 0.31 moles of sulfur, we're going to use up 0.31 moles of iron as well. So therefore what's going to be left over is going to be 0.05 moles of Fe, right? But they asked for the grams. So now we have to go again, number of moles is mass over the molar mass. So to get the mass, what do we need to do? We have to multiply. So we're going to go 0, 0, 5 multiplied by the molar mass for Fe, which is 56. And that is going to give me the mass of the Fe left after it's finished. So if we take our 0, comma, naught, five, and we multiply it by 56, we end up with two comma, eight grams. So we're left with two comma, eight grams of Fe left. There we go, not too bad, eh? 
Right, I think this is the last. Yay, that is the last question. Um, okay, let's see how we do. It says magnesium burns in air to form magnesium oxide according to the following balanced equation. So you've got two magnesiums plus one oxygen gives you two magnesium oxide. Okay, it says if the percentage yield of this reaction is only 80%, Calculate the mass of the magnesium that needs to be burned to produce 30 grams of magnesium oxide. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So we're saying, let's just rewrite it. We've got two magnesium plus oxygen gives us magnesium oxide and there's two. It gives us 30 grams, but that is equal to 80% of the theoretical yield theoretical yield okay so we actually need to work out what the proper the theoretical yield would have been okay before we can work out how much magnesium we actually needed to burn because even though we only got out 80 percent we actually need to burn the real amount the theoretical amount in order to get out that 30 grams okay the rest obviously is being used up or not converting properly but we uh, have to work out what the 100% would be in order to work out what magnesium what the, the magnesium is that we need so first thing we're going to do is we're going to take that 30 grams and the way to do it is you times about 100 and you divide it by 80 okay because what you're doing is you are basically dividing by 80 to get one percent and then times in by 100 to get to a hundred percent so that means that we're timesing it by five over four so let's do that that becomes 30 times by five equals divide by four equals 37.5 so the theoretical yield the, th the theoretical yield the theoretical yield would have been 37.5 grams now we can look at that and work out the number of moles that is because the number of moles is mass over the molar mass and we remember we never compare more masses and masses we compare moles so that is going to be 37 comma 5 divided by the molar mass of magnesium oxide now magnesium is 24 and oxygen is 16 so that's 37 comma 5 divided by 40 so let's just work that out so 37.5 divided by 40 which equals 0.94 it equals 0.94 moles okay now we know how many moles of magnesium oxide we're making now we have to look at our mole ratio and if we look at our mole ratio we see the mole ratio is two to two two to two right so if the mole ratio is two to two then do you agree we can say well therefore we're gonna use 0.94 moles of magnesium okay that's how much we need because the ratio is two to two which means it's a ratio of one to one which means that if we're producing 0.94 moles of magnesium oxide we have to use 0.94 moles of magnesium so now what we need to do is work out the mass so again number of moles is mass over molar mass so therefore mass is going to be the number of moles which is 0.94 multiplied by the molar mass which is just of magnesium which in this case is 24 so if we take our calculus we can take this 0.937 and just times it by 24 and we get 22.5 grams 22,5 grams so if we started with 22,5 grams and there was only an 80% yield, we would end up with 30 grams of magnesium oxide. 
I really like that question. That's a very nice question because of the yield thing, the percentage yield thing. It's a very good question. Right. Enough of stoichiometry and quantitative aspects of chemical change. Let's talk electrostatics. Okay, so what you need to know is that obviously there are things that are positive charges and there are negative charges. Okay, and neutral objects have the same number of positive and negative charges. So if you look at this neutral object here, you can see that, and please understand that we're not talking now about atoms. We're talking about whether something is positively charged or negatively charged, okay? And if it's neutral, the number of positive charges equals the number of negative charges. So for every negative, there is a positive. So therefore, this is neutral. However, if you look at this balloon, you can see it is very positively charged, or this balloon, which in the case is very negatively charged. Now, you can charge something by causing it to gain or lose electrons. Please remember that the only thing that's actually moving is not the protons because they're in the middle of the nucleus. So the only time that we change anything to do with the protons is when we're talking radioactive stuff, okay? So if we've got something that's positively charged, it means that it's lost electrons. Whereas if it's negatively charged, it means that it's gained electrons. Now let's talk about the forces between charges. Like charges repel. Unlike charges attract, okay? So if you've got two objects or anything, two atoms, two um, balloons, which you've managed to positively charge, okay? Or have a positive charge, then they are going to repel. Okay. Also, if they're both negatively charged, they're going to repel. However, if the one is positively charged and the other is negatively charged, what's going to happen? They are going to attract one another. So this is the same as we always say, opposites attract. Well, in this case, there you go, opposites are attracting. So now, let's talk about Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is the relationship between the forces experienced by charged objects when situated a certain distance apart, okay? This year is actually Coulomb's law. So if they ask you to state Coulomb's law, you need to say that the force of attraction or repulsion between electric charges at rest is directly sorry, is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Okay, so the force of attraction or repulsion between the electric charges, electric charges at rest is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distances between their centers. So if you, rec you might recognize this to look almost identical to the force of universal gravitation, I mean the law of universal gravitation, because it is, okay? What it's saying is that the force is proportional to the product of the charges, okay? The force is also proportional to, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the centers. Therefore, the force is proportional to Q1, Q2 over R squared. And then actually there was a gentleman, uh, by the name of Coulomb, who basically came up with this value of K. So we now know that F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, where K is nine times by 10 to the nine. It is on your formula sheet, and the units are Newtons, meters squared coulombs to negative two, 
Okay. Don't worry too much about these units. You never have to fill them in and they are on a formula sheet, so don't stress about it. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do an example. Okay. It says consider the diagram below not drawn to scale. So we've got Q1, which is plus 4 microcoulombs. There is Q2, which is minus 6 microcoulombs. That is, they are 15 centimeters apart. There is Q3, which is 4, I mean 100 millimeters apart from Q1, and is minus 5 microcoulombs. Okay, so the first thing it says is draw a free body diagram of all the electrostatic forces that act on Q1. Also show the net electrostatic force. Label all the forces clearly. Okay, so Q1 is over here, so we're going to draw it up here. Okay, now the positive and the negative tell us whether or not there's going to be attraction or repulsion. So do you agree Q1 is being pulled towards Q3? This is a positive charge, this is a negative charge. So there's a force of attraction happening over here. So this is the force of Q3 on Q1, okay? Also, there's a force of attraction up this way. So there's a force of Q2 on Q1. So what would the resultant be? Do you agree in this case, what I would need to do is I'd need to complete my parallelogram and that would be my resultant, F resultant. Okay, right, so now that we've done that, or F net, okay, it says calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force between Q1 and Q2. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so we want the magnitude of the electrostatic force between Q1 and Q2. Okay, so the force between Q1 and Q2 is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Okay, so K is pretty obvious to work out, I mean to fill in, but Q1, please understand that you need to know what these micros mean. And it's milli micro nano. So therefore it's 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 9. So micro is 10 to the minus 6. So it's K times by 6 times by 10 to the negative 6. And then it's times by 4 times by 10 to the negative 6 all over the distance between them. But note that this is in centimeters and what does it need to be? It needs to be in meters. So this becomes 0, 15 divided by 100 is 0, 0,15 all squared. And that is the force of Q1 on Q2. And we will continue with exa this example and then continue with electrostatics on Thursday. Have a great day.